Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us at Putting the Eye in Transit, the research behind SEPTA's new wayfinding. Uh, I'm Megan Ryerson. I'm the UPS Chair of Transportation, Associate Professor of Systems Engineering and Sitting and Regional Planning uh, here at the Weitzman School of Design. And I'm delighted today to be on a panel to discuss wayfinding uh, with uh, Camille Bogan, uh, who is a graduate of our program and participated in the research of this project uh, with uh, Leslie Richards, the CEO and general manager of SEPTA, and uh, Lex Powers uh, of SEPTA as well. It's a particularly special moment uh, to present on some of our research related to uh, wayfinding, a particularly special moment for me as a faculty at Penn, as uh, it's not just Camille and I representing uh, the University of Pennsylvania tonight, but also Lex is a grad of our uh, City and Regional Planning Master's program, uh, and Leslie as a grad of uh, the, the Weitzman School in the City and Regional Planning uh, program as well. So a really, really exciting moment. Uh, so throughout the evening, you're going to hear about uh, SEPTA's new wayfinding, SEPTA's new wayfinding uh, study, SEPTA's new wayfinding approach, and the research that, uh, that our team did in order to support SEPTA's new way forward in order to make a system that is truly more accessible for everybody who, every, everybody who wants to take it. Uh, and uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Leslie Richards, the CEO and general manager of SEPTA. I'd like to just introduce Leslie, uh, 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 Leslie a little bit. Um, uh, when I met Leslie, uh, she was accepting the Women's Transportation Seminar uh, Woman of the Year Award. And uh, I just remember Leslie talking about her path to being Montgomery County C Commissioner, uh, building coalitions, listening to people, uh, engaging in local planning processes, really thinking about you know, what would make people's lives better, really listening to people, and thinking about how to turn wants, needs, and constraints into plans and processes that would really change people's lives. Leslie took that as, L L Leslie did just that as Montgomery County Commissioner and then became the Secretary of Transportation for the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, while PennDOT Secretary, and Leslie did so many things as PennDOT Secretary, so I'll just highlight a few things that really uh, stick out to me. Uh, while Leslie was the Secretary of PennDOT, she really lived the idea that transportation is so much more than getting people from A to B, right? Leslie took on uh, human trafficking. Leslie took on um, uh, 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 Leslie took on making sure every innovation she made was resilient and sustainable for a future where we have more extreme weather events. Leslie brought a perspective that integrated research, that integrated the needs, the mobility needs of you know, the incredibly diverse population of Pennsylvania into all of her plans. Uh, now at, at SEPTA, you know, we here in Philadelphia have the the amazing fortune of uh, getting to benefit from this perspective that Leslie now brings to, to SEPTA. It was really amazing to read recently about SEPTA's, uh, SEPTA's efforts to work with some of the unhoused population. Um, uh, and to work with them in a way that's full of compassion and, uh, and, and inclusion. And I'm just truly inspired by the work that uh, SEPTA, SEPTA is doing. Uh, Leslie, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for everything, and uh, thanks for what you're about to say here about SEPTA's Wayfinding Initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's so nice. Oh. I love the <laughs> I know for um, recording purposes and, and listening, it's best if I have the microphone here. Um, but thank you. I, I was just thinking, I love an in-person meeting. That was, first of all, a, a lovely intro. I do remember meeting you as well. It seems like a lifetime ago. 
Um, I also remember after we met seeing you at DVRPC meetings where you would bike in with your helmet and uh, in the background and uh, we would catch up there as well, which was, which was all great. You, you stay true to your, um, to your vision and your goals as well. Um, look, I don't want to speak too long because I'm so excited about the information uh, that we're about to share with you. I know Lex and Camille have uh, uh, really nice slides and pictures and uh, want to show you what, what is going on. Um, and I will be here for, to answer questions afterwards and happy to do so. But I just want to let you know when I came here, um, one of the things that our planning team brought to my attention very quickly was the ideas that they had. I already knew that our system was hard to get around. I already knew some of the challenges. Um, I grew up in Bucks County. I lived in Montgomery County. At the, uh, I also lived in Philadelphia County. And I knew that using SEPTA uh, could sometimes um, be difficult. And not knowing where you are on a system can make you feel nervous or can also be a reason why you don't use the system. And so understanding that our ridership, even before the pandemic, needed uh, to be reviewed, uh, the reasons why people were using our system and not, uh, this was a big reason for it. And so at that point, I met Lex Powers, who I, I did not know before. Um, I was lucky enough to lure Jody Holton, who's here as well as our AGM uh, for planning. Uh, we work together at the county. And um, it's good to see, by the way, Will Herzog here as well. I think Noah Lee I saw early. Anyone else from SEPTA that I didn't see, I just want to acknowledge. Um, so, all of these ideas, in fact, um, Lex and, and the team gave me a thick binder of planning issues that we could, we could address, and they were very excited about it. And one of them uh, was wayfinding and branding. And I thought, what an amazing idea. What have we done so far? How can we even um, expand this effort? And how can we do it in a way that is meaningful? Uh, obviously, with a lot of public engagement where we can get customer feedback and where we can really take a look at the system like it has not been looked at in a very comprehensive way. Jody and her team, they embarked on a strategic plan in the middle of a pandemic, by the way. I'm so proud of their work, SEPTA Forward. Please check it out if you haven't already. And all of this work falls under the strategic plan. Even today, um, we already have three um, requests for us to talk about our strategic plan. Um, APTA wants us to present nationally. Uh, New York just asked us, uh, as well as LA and um, some other Chicago is asking us. So we are making waves in that uh, way, and I know we're making waves here. Um, with that, I also just want to say uh, I had the honor of being on the FIFA um, bid team here in Philadelphia, where we're trying to get um, the World Cup to play here in Philadelphia. And as part of that presentation, transportation plays a big part of it. Uh, transit plays a big part of it. The other cities that we are in competition with, uh, I know their transit systems well. Ours really knocks it out of the park, so I wanted to make sure that they knew about that, how fans could get around, how people could get to venues, how vendors could be there. And I also wanted to address how people visiting here from other countries who may not speak English as their first language would be able to get around our system. And I was thrilled to be able to highlight the work that Lex and his team are doing right now. And afterwards, members of the FIFA team came over to me and said, we'd really like to talk to you. We have not heard any of the host cities talk about getting around their city and their transit system the way that you did. And so I got to talk to them about the work that we are doing. And I know it is going to play a big part. I really hope we get it. And if we do, I think a big part of why we get it is because of this wayfinding work uh, that we are undergoing. So with that, I'm going to stop talking because I really want you to see all this exciting work. And um, I'll be here afterwards to answer any questions for you. And thanks so much for joining us. It is exciting for me to work on. 
and it's exciting uh, for us to share what SEPTA has been doing and of course our partnership with the University of Pennsylvania has been spectacular and when they told me that I would get to use and wear very cool eye tracking goggles as part of this project of course I would jump in on that and uh, it's just a really unique way of seeing what people see on our system and how uh, they maneuver our system and navigate just such an innovative uh, way to collect data as well as useful data so I thank you for that. Um, so with that, let's get on with the show. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'll tell you, I never really thought uh, in all my life that I would be sharing a stage with my old esteemed professor and the general manager of SEPTA. Uh, you know, this is somewhat surreal in that way. So thank, thank you so much for, um, you know, that kind introduction. So. I'm going to just give you an overview as quick as I possibly can of the SEPTA Metro wayfinding proposal. And like I said, as quick as I can because I want to get into the research and the other stuff that we have to talk about. I am known to go on for a long time about this topic. Um, so I will do my best. I think that, you know, rooting ourselves back in that strategic plan that Leslie mentioned, there are a bunch of trends going on with transit and the way that people are traveling right now. A lot of this was going on before the, the pandemic, but a, a lot of these same trends have accelerated through the pandemic. So what we're seeing is more dynamic travel patterns. It's harder to predict when people are going where. Services and transportation flow is less peaked. So it's less oriented towards the nine to five period. Um, and then the people who are actually typically working nine to five right aren't traveling necessarily during that period either. If you've looked at the census data uh, that, that has come out recently about the Philadelphia region, we're also diversifying. We have people moving here from other countries in larger numbers than has been true for you know at least a half a century. Um, you know, so really there's a need for transit to make itself more easily understood for people who are new to the region, but also for riders who are finding themselves using transit in different ways than they did even, you know, a few years ago. We want to make sure that you can show up and use SEPTA to get where you need to go the first time, um, you know, versus a past where maybe you were re repeating the same trip over and over because you were a peak rider, for example. So the answer to that, in, in a lot of ways, is to is to to move towards a network type of thinking. And this is something that you know comes naturally, I think, to a lot of other transit agencies, not necessarily for SEPTA. We have historically seen our services as very separate from each other, and there are historical reasons for that. You know, the L was built by a different company that built the Broad Street line was different than the trolleys, was different than the Norris on a speed line. They're all slightly different modes. Um, you know, it's it's hard to talk about these lines that come comprise the Philadelphia region's subway or metro network in any way, in any terms that people understand. You can see the, what that means for wayfinding by looking at uh, the signage that you see on the left. So everything's got a separate brand. The terminology sometimes is 100 years old. It correlates to a network that is no longer around when you think about the trolley lines. For example, being 10, 11, 13, 34, and 36. Um, you know, those are just the streetcar lines that survived busification. It's completely random. They're not numbered that way for any reason. Um, you, you besides that they use the tunnel and that makes them resilient um, as transit services. So, you know, we ask people this question all the time. If, if you look at this on the right, this network, what is it? How do you use it? Tell me what it's for. What are the services like? What is it useful for? And no one can tell me. I do the same sort of picture where I take out those lines and I show regional rail, for example. Everyone knows what it's called. Everyone knows what the schedule's like. Everyone knows how to buy a ticket. It. Everyone knows what a station looks like. The, the awareness between the two networks is so different and that plays into the way that we think about it locally as easy to use as difficult to use. And, and the actual signage, because it is not seen as an actual entity, what you have is a different system of communication for every single line. So you have to learn every line as if it is a unique system to itself. So we're gonna go a little bit into you know, the project that we have 
have to simplify that and make it more accessible. Uh, you know, as Leslie said, we wanted to do this in a data-driven way. We have to replace our signs. It is a state of good repair project. We've tried spot fixes before, and all it, that it leads to is more inconsistency when you do one station and then another one and then another one. Um, you know, so now is the time to really back up because we have this generational project and think about what is the appropriate information, what is the appropriate strategy that will be useful not just for us now, but uh, you know, for the next century of transit riders. Um, so we've done a lot of outreach, we've done a lot of research. I'm going to skip through it a little bit quickly because I want Megan and Camille to talk about it. Uh, we did interactive workshops with different stakeholders, people who represent people with disabilities, immigrants, refugees, non-English speakers, students, international tourists were all involved in identifying these problems and talking about what the solutions could be. And then skip, because that's Megan's slide. Uh, we did a great project with, uh, with eye tracking that you'll learn about in, in, in a little bit. Um, you know, but some of the take-home points about our signs and their weaknesses, they're very wordy. They rely on full English sentences. If you do not speak English, you will not find your way around. They use technical terminology. So sometimes it's like SEPTA employees talking to SEPTA employees. We use words that we don't know other people don't know. <laughs> Um, you know, there's inconsistent use of station names, line names, branding, colors, fonts, etc. Uh, there's inconsistency in the design and the sign placement, poor information hierarchy. Lack of information is obviously a big problem. There are some stations on the system that don't have signs at all. Um, and then outdated information and brand presence. So through the outreach that we did um, over the first 18 months of this project, the priorities that we heard from from the people that we collaborated with was to develop a new system of wayfinding that can be understood by new and long-standing riders alike, to design for accessibility and universality, so obviously that's people with disabilities, it's people who don't speak English, immigrants and refugees, students, international students especially, um, and tourists and business travelers. These are the groups that we've really tried to engage as much as possible because that is who wayfinding is for. Um, and to also build off of what works so we don't want to clear everything that exists. We want to identify what is working, leverage those things, build off of them, and create something that feels like a natural iteration, um, but not at the expense of ease of use and comprehension. So if keeping something makes it more complicated, um, it doesn't survive into the recommendations. To allow for growth and flexibility over time, we also have a ton of capital projects um, and a ton of service planning projects right now that are, that are going to necessitate rethinking how we talk about our system, trolley modernization, KOP rail, bus revolution. It needs to be flexible enough to take into consideration those changes. Um, and then to use terminology and language that speak to riders, not staff. So I'm hoping that this is the right audience to talk about brand hierarchy. I haven't been able to get into this, um, you know, but School of Design, Design Philadelphia, maybe, maybe it is something that you guys will enjoy. Um, but really, the, 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 the core of the communications process Problem that we have is a dysfunctional brand hierarchy. If you go on the on the SEPTA website, for example, you'll see on the left there's a button for regional rail, there's a button for bus, then there's a, a button for Market Frankfurt Line, a button for Broad Street Line, a button for the trolleys, and a button for Norris Town High Speed Line. If you don't know where you're going, you don't know what those are. You know, you don't have that information yet. So we and we talk about all of these things as if they are completely separate. So in the same way that we group our regional rail lines into an entity, the proposal is to group these rail transit lines into an entity as well. This is the way that brand hierarchy breaks down when you actually start talking about service patterns. So the provider in both the existing and the, the recommendations is SEPTA. Um, but right now, you know, sometimes we talk about the L and the Broad Street Line as if they're separate. Sometimes they're subway elevated. The trolleys are their own network. What is a line and what is a service pattern is not actually very clear. Sometimes it's the green line. Sometimes it's the subway surface line. Sometimes it's the which is a subset of those. Um, the media Sharon Hill line also uh, is sometimes referred to as a line and sometimes as a network that breaks down into the 101 and the 102. 
The reason that you need something on the right that is more organized is because when you're constructing wayfinding, this is your menu of information. This is the, the path of what information are you providing at what point on your journey, what is the decision point? When do you need to know what the provider is? When do you need to know what the network is? When do you need to know what the line is? And then the service pattern. It breaks down further with then like directionality. That if your branding hierarchy isn't set like that, all of your signage is going to be a mess. So the first recommendation um, you know, is to come up with a word and a symbol for that network. And the proposal right now is to use the term metro. Pretty much every city in the world calls this sort of network a metro, a subway, or an underground, or the local translation of one of those words. Metro was preferable during the early conversations that we had because it doesn't say anything about whether something is above ground or below ground or on the surface. It's also also more mode agnostic. You can use it to refer to light rail. You can use it to refer to heavy rail. And in fact, we've seen that sort of expand with terms like light metro or pre-metro, that it's not, it's not as exclusive to what you would think of as like the broad straight line as it used to be. It's also recognized in nearly every language. Um, you know, it, so it translates well. Um, and it, we were able to repeat it over and over at every station to make sure that it is understood what, what network you are boarding. That symbol itself harkens back to the historic SEPTA symbol. So this goes into like, we want to keep what is valuable to people. These arrows have really strong brand equity. People love this symbol. Um, you know, people wear tokens as jewelry, which basically looks like this symbol, that <laughs> this symbol. Um, so we definitely don't want to get rid of that. Um, and then for the choice of the letters, we're choosing letters because right now actually using pictograms is not a super helpful way of denoting services for people who are new. We don't want people to have to study what our vehicles look like. Um, you know, so a simple letter can act as a simpler pictogram. L for the Market Frankfurt Line because we all call it the L anyway. A lot of people think where I've been, I've, I've had people come up to me and say, I didn't even know it was spelled E-L. I thought it was already called the letter L because because it's shaped like an L. I'm like, I had no idea that, you know, that was one of the lines of thinking. Um, B for broad straight line, M for the Norristani speed line, can't use an end of line um, for the actual line designation, which is why we're moving towards something that's a bit more agnostic. Um, and then breaking the trolleys up into, into three categories. So once you start to create this language, the signs kind of create themselves. Um, you know, so we're working with now um, a designer to create station beacons that can be applied consistently to every station within the network, no matter when it was built, what architectural style, what company built it, so it will all feel cohesive. Um, you know, a proposed map um, that actually uses that same branding hierarchy that I talked about, where those rail transit lines come to the front. Um, you know, it is worth saying that, um, you know, we, we have the frequent bus network on the map on the right. Um, you know, that, the lines that you see on the map on, on the right make up like 80% of SEPTA's daily ridership. The map on the left shows about 50% of the lines in SEPTA's daily ridership. Although we talk a lot about regional rail, for example, even pre COVID, it was only about 10% of our daily riders, whereas this network that we're talking about that we can't name is about, was about 40%. Um, so, you know, having the trolleys on there, if we're going to be modernizing our trolley network um, and upgrading them to ADA, we better start showing them on our system map because we currently don't do that. Um, you know, and then other tools like showing service patterns, whether something is bel below or above ground. Um, same strategy for the consistent line maps and the different sorts of design recommendations that we have there, like you are here, stickers, um, and more information about transfers. So the recommendations end up making transit look like it's the front door of a city, which it should be. It should feel like the front door, not the back door. There are so many entrances. This is on the Broad Street line that you can't find. You can drive over a Broad Street line subway station with thousands of daily riders and you would never know it because some of the entrances are, you know, hidden behind a bush or a parked car. Um, you know, there are serious consequences for that. Um, um, 
So, you know, it's just an illustration of how that is applied to Walnut Locust Station, to Allegheny on the L. You know, the key here is that we can apply it consistently to these lines that can be very different from each other. 40th Street Portal on the, the trolleys, the future T, T uh, two through four. Um, you know, and I said that, you know, I came from SEPTA's long range planning department, so everything that we work on has a long range planning component. Um, you know, but we, we are setting, each, we're, we are setting each, ourselves up here for two major projects, King of Prussia Rail Extension um, and Trolley Modernization by emphasizing the importance of those lines within our metro network, that they are an integral piece of our metro network, just like the, the Market Frankfurt Line and the Broad Street Line, um, and that they both deserve regional attention. So right now we're focused on getting um, public feedback on a lot of these proposals. That's what they are right now is proposals. So this is some e examples of posters that we have installed within the system. You can use a QR code to submit a comment or call a number and it will bring you to our website map.septa.org which I encourage everyone to look at. You can see all of this stuff in way more detail so you know you don't have me clicking through things quickly um, or use that QR code also. So we will be collecting feedback on this stuff until uh, the end of October. Um, so please, if you have any thoughts, uh, we really do read every single comment, so go ahead. And I think with that, I will hand it over to Megan and Camille to talk about their research. In, in my research, I think a lot about accessibility and a person's ability to access destinations that they'd like to go to. And when I think about wayfinding, wayfinding is really a key component of accessibility. Leslie talked about feeling safe or not safe or feeling insecure during a, 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 a connection, right? And, and that really provides a lot of motivation for, for, for me, for, for my team to think about wayfinding as a way to make our transit system more accessible to people for whom we might not even realize that, that transit isn't accessible, right? It's, it's, it's really a, a new way to consider accessibility. Um, and you know what Camille is about to uh, uh, tell you about is our research uh, on the challenge points, the pain points, the stressful moments that a traveler might experience while they are traversing while they are traversing SEPTA stations. Uh, and I'll say the way that we wanted to do it was we didn't want to presuppose what the the stressful points are, right? I think that uh, too many times our, our stations are designed by people who understand transportation really, really well, and we are some, we are living with the with the effects of that. So we didn't want to say we want to study this stressful point. We wanted to say, you know, move through the system, and we are going to use data to figure out what your most stressful points are and we're going to infer we're going to infer design lessons from that so our mode of choice to be able to study wayfinding in that way was to use eye tracking glasses and so we instrumented uh, many subjects with eye tracking glasses and had them execute a number of missions and a number of transfer missions in the station and then using data science and um, uh, uh, and visuals from the data, we were able to identify some of the most stressful moments uh, that a that a person experienced while they were doing that um, while while they were doing that course. Um, I'd really like to give a mention here to uh, Will Herzog, uh, also a grad of our program, um, uh, uh, who is now at SEPTA, uh, who was absolutely uh, instrumental in gathering an, an incredibly diverse representative uh, group of people who were willing to walk the station and provide their physical biometric feedback and, and also their, their verbal feedback. We learned an immense amount from our subjects 
and um, uh, Will, uh, Will's ability to uh, engage uh, the community and community members from many different groups is an absolute masterclass in community engagement. So uh, the results that you are going to see here are, are very much uh, related to those efforts. Uh, Camille Bogan, uh, who has been my research assistant for the last two years uh, and has um, uh, recently uh, uh, recently uh, moved on, miss you very much in the group, uh, is uh, going to uh, give a presentation of our research. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction, Megan. Um, I just want to say before I start, uh, this project has been probably my biggest success of grad school. It was such a pleasure to work on this. I have spent many, many hours in City Hall, and I can now navigate that station with my <laughs> blindfold on. Um, and I hope that you see from this presentation that it shouldn't take that many hours to be able to navigate City Hall with a blindfold on. Um, and uh, I learned so much from shadowing so many different users um, in City Hall and it brought in Erie, some who are in this room now. Um, and it was just such a great experience to be able to really feel what it's like to be a confused and frustrated writer on this system that so many people rely on every single day to get to work, to get to doctor's appointments, to get their kids to school. Um, and this research project has been so important and I hope that you can see how what we collected has made its way into the recommendations that Lex just presented. Um, so here's just a quick presentation overview. There are a lot of slides, so I may skip over some. As Megan said, we collected a lot of data, and there's a lot to go through, but I'm going to try to hit on just some of the most important parts. Um, so I'll go over a little bit over the components of the project, um, again, talking about the community engagement that we did, the major themes that we got from each of these stations, um, and some of the participant responses, which you can really see express how frustrating and how difficult it was for some users to just make very simple decisions that most people don't think about when they're regular writers of this system. Um, so first, here's like a brief introduction of the eye tracking glasses we use. They are called the Tobii Pro eye tracking glasses, and they are able to collect video, eye, and head movement data at 100 times per second. Um, this data can be layered over images so you can see where exactly users are looking at as they're navigating, um, and you'll see some images later on of how exactly that's plotted onto images and how we use that to identify um, where users are looking, where they're stressed out, um, and how their eyes are moving along as they're walking through stations. Um, the components of this exercise were two parts. So we had a map exercise where we came up with a list of um, destinations and had users try to point to where they are on the maps to get an understanding of how do users use the maps and is there enough information for them to navigate to where they need to go. And the second was a transfer navigation. So this is where we actually had the users walking through the station with the glasses on. So for example, we would ask them, okay, you are on the westbound uh, Market Franklin Line station now you need to get to the eastbound, um, sorry, the eastbound trolley station. How do you get there? You're on uh, the southbound Broad Street line. How do you get to the westbound trolleys? And actually walked these users through um, the station to see where they get lost, where they get stressed, to see if they can make these transfers. Um, here are a few pictures from our testing days. Um, so we... Uh, at City Hall, we focused on concourse transfers. That's usually the most difficult part of City Hall, if any of you have ever been there, is trying to get from one platform to the other, preferably without having to pay. Because there are free transfers at City Hall, they, what we really wanted to understand was, are people leaving the station and then coming back in and paying multiple times because they don't know where they're going? Um, and at Broad and Erie, we wanted to focus on rail to bus connections because those are more common there. And seeing, is it easy for people to get off the Broad Street line and get to the next bus they need to go to and vice versa. Um, as Megan mentioned, uh, we worked with Will Herzog to collect um, data from a variety of interest groups and users. Um, it was a really fantastic process to be able to experience transit not just you know, as an able-bodied person who really loves transit and is committed to using it, but like in this picture, someone who uses a wheelchair or someone who does not speak English, um, which really gives you a broader picture of who exactly is using the station and is it easy for anyone who might be trying to get somewhere to use it. 
For example, we actually had a participant who did not speak English and we had to find a translator. Um, and uh, I know Megan did this walkthrough and it was really eye-opening to see what it's like, not only as someone who doesn't speak English, but also doesn't even use you know, the anglicized letters that we use. And these are not symbols that they're used to seeing. And understanding what uh, the difficulties are when you have you know, full English sentences as your wayfinding system. So here we have City Hall. Um, so the major themes that we found um, across stations were pretty similar. There was either missing information, so there was no signage or reassurance for uh, participants to you know, make transfers or to find anything on a map. Um, there was inadequate information, so the information is there, but either something is missing or it's not complete or it's too confusing. Um, and then there's the actual infrastructure itself of the station that makes it difficult. So whether that's a blocked interest or even poor sanitation that is distracting um, people from actually being able to get to where they need to go. Um, if anyone's ever tried to uh, get to the westbound trolley station in City Hall, you'll know that it is impossible if you don't know where you're going because there are no signs until you get to the uh, Broad Street Line platform. Um, so 8% of everyone that we studied uh, made this connection smoothly without either leaving the station and having to pay again or having to ask me uh, how to get there. Um, and uh, and many of them made wrong turns, and we even had, you know, a able-bodied, very, you know, pro-transit, loves transportation, grad student at Penn, who took twice as long as everyone else to make this transfer. Um, so if you're on the Market uh, Frankfurt Line platform, there's no sign that says westbound trolley. Uh, often everyone sees the eastbound trolley and thinks, oh, there must be the westbound trolley on that side too, which is not the case. Um, and, you know, once they have walked in circles five times, they finally realize, oh, I need to go to the Broad Street Line, and then that's where the platform is. Um, there's one sign, and it is on the wall going to the southbound station and uh, most people miss it. And once you are there, there are again no signs. You know, users are expected to like see these green signs all the way to the other end of the platform uh, to know that that's where they're going. And often many people would walk towards the stairs and then be like, no, this is in the right direction. And then turn around and then realize that they were going in the right direction. Um, a second thing we found is that there are also no bus transfer signs anywhere in City Hall, uh, especially in the westbound trolley concourse, once people actually made it there. Um, if you are making a transfer at the hub of SEPTA's network, why aren't there signs that tell you where the buses are? Um, most uh, participants had to ask SEPTA staff directly how to get to the 44 bus. Um, and as you can see here, someone even said, there's never a map of how to get to the buses and how am I supposed to know without asking someone? Um, and then the next point is that the bus shelters are across 15th and JFK, and there's no sign to indicate which buses they are, uh, how to get there, and whether or not it's even in the right direction. Um, and you know, for an able-bodied person, having to wait to cross the street is not that big of a deal, but if you're in a wheelchair, or you've got two kids, or it just takes you a little bit longer, um, deciding on whether or not you wanna cross that street is a huge decision point. Um, and it definitely highlighted that there needs to be large signage before you make that decision to cross the street in order to know which bus you're going to and whether you're going in the right direction. Um, and then here's a gaze plot. So this is one of the things we're able to create with the eye tracking glasses. Um, each number represents um, uh, the order in which a participant looked in that direction and the color represents a participant. Um, so you can see that there are no signs here on this uh, hallway to the Broad Street line from the Market Frankfurt line that are, letting that are letting people know where they're going and if they're going in the right direction. Um, I'm sure so many of you have seen these are now filled now with the signs that uh, Lex just presented, but before they were blank and there was nothing there. Um, and there's a small sign that says to the Broad Street line in the sports complex, but before there was these large empty signs that were very distracting because people were expecting information to be there and it wasn't. 
Um, another thing we talked about was the system map, and especially for this participant, uh, it was too dense. There's too much information uh, about destinations that they were interested in, and there wasn't enough information about other destinations. One of the questions we asked participants was how to get to Fairmount Park, and it's not on the map. You know, there aren't major destinations on any of the existing maps, so people are kind of relying on streets and maybe some symbols to figure out where they're going, but that was very confusing, especially for participants who, for whom English wasn't their first language and they were relying on symbols rather than words. Um, this is also a very confusing sign, I'm sure. Many of you have also seen this. Uh, a lot of participants were like, does this mean turn around? Does this mean go upstairs? Um, and many people did both. They went back upstairs and realized it was the wrong way. Um, and you can see here as this gaze plot is people stared at this sign for a very long time, trying to figure out what it meant. Um, and that's the, you know, the benefit of these glasses that we can see how long someone is looking at something and where their focus is and using that data to really pinpoint what exactly is confusing about signage. Um, and this was another big one that uh, was very frustrating not only to watch but to not be able to help because this was part of the research project was um, many SEPTA employees you know, didn't know how to get to the westbound station either. They would direct a lot of participants to just go to 30th Street and transfer there. And while that is, you know, it's, you can do that, it's not really an appropriate response for someone who's supposed to be representing an organization and should be able to direct users the correct way to get somewhere, um, which also shows that many of these employees also weren't really well aware of how to get there, and that is something that was important to the wayfinding as well, that you know these representatives um, of this organization and these employees also need to be able to tell you know, customers where they're going and how to get there the most efficient way. And I'm sure you also have all seen this, is that many of the station entrances were closed during these trials. And this was back in uh, March, April, and many more of them are closed now. But there were no signs to let users know that certain entrances were closed and how long they would be closed. Um, many participants would see signs and then go in that direction, and then there would be a gate, and they would have to start all over again because they couldn't use these entrances that you know, didn't have any notification that they were inaccessible. Um, so here's the, again, here are some of the key takeaways we had from City Hall. You know, the biggest point was figuring out how to get signage onto those westbound trolleys because most people don't know how to get there. Um, the lack of bus information, uh, the blank walls where there should be reassuring information, where there isn't, especially when people need to make critical decisions to make a transfer because you only have so many minutes before you miss a train or your next bus. Um, and you know, really alerting customers when entrances are closed, how long they're going to be closed and notifying them ahead of time before they make the decision to go all the way up the stairs or to take the elevator, you know, if they need a mobility device and putting in all of that effort to only find out that the entrance they needed was closed. And then we have brought in Erie. Um, so the major themes here were pretty much the same. Um, the biggest one about Broad and Erie was the outside environment, so less within the station itself, but if you've ever been to Broad Erie in Germantown, it is a lot of strodes with uh, very short crosswalk times and a lot of roads crossing at once with many different buses going in many different directions. Um, there's also a lot of commercial signage, as you saw in the picture that Lex showed, that often kind of uh, overwhelms some of the transit signs because they're not bright enough or visible enough. Um, and again, inadequate information um, that has some information that's somewhat useful but doesn't give you the full picture to give you the right direction to go in. Um, so the biggest one that we found here was street crossings. So there is no signage at Broad and Erie to let users know that they are crossing the correct street to get to the correct bus going in the correct direction. Um, there are many wide, busy streets that have you know, a limited time, and once you decide to cross that street, you are locked into that decision. You have to wait again to go back, and at that point you could miss your bus um, or miss your transfer and then have to wait another 15, 30 minutes before your next bus comes. 
Um, this was a great image that uh, one of our other research assistants, Bing Chu, put together. So we asked participants to go from the uh, Broadnery station to the 23 bus, and there are two stations going in opposite directions. And these arrows show the routes that people took because there were no signs pointing to where the 23 bus uh, stop was um, and which direction it was in. And as you can see, people crossed and then crossed again and crossed again. And uh, very few, I think maybe one person was actually able to make that crossing once within you know, enough time to make that bus if they were going from the Broad Street Line to the 23. And then we asked them to find the XH bus, which there's only one stop for. Um, and again, you had to cross all of these streets multiple times. And again, if you're an able-bodied person who knows where you're going, it might not be that big of a deal. But if you have a mobility device or you've got kids and you need to cross two or three streets just to get to your bus, that's a serious commitment. Um, and there needs to be signage that lets you know that you are going in the right direction, that the bus is the, you know, the eastbound bus that you need or the westbound bus, what side of the street it's on, um, and uh, a sign that's actually visible so you're not kind of wandering around over and over again. As I mentioned before, there is a lot of visual clutter at this corner. There's a lot of advertising. There are a lot of cars. There's just a lot happening visually, and it's very hard to see the signs. Um, as you can see in this picture, you can't see any of the bus signs. You know, if you look at a regular SEPTA bus sign, it's very small, um, and you can't really see it until you're like right in front of it, and then you realize, oh, this isn't the right bus that I need. Um, and one participant actually stood under the bus shelter, not realizing that this is actually where they needed to go. And they kept asking me, like, is this the right place? Is this the right place? And I'm like, well, I can't tell you, but if you kind of turn around, you might be able to see. Um, and the numbers on the bus shelters are very small, and they're really hard to see, um, which is a huge problem for any of the bus stations, but particularly here, where there is already a lot of visual and like audio uh, clutter as well. You know, it's very loud, um, which can also be distracting when trying to navigate. Uh, here are some quotes from the video feed. <laughs> Um, it was really, uh, the glasses have a really uh, great feature where you can also hear the audio, so it was great to be able to listen back to these and realize how lost and frustrated people were uh, when trying to navigate. So having all those components together was really great to get a full picture of how people are navigating these stations. Um, and again, a lot of this, uh, the hallways at Broad and Erie were closed off. We had one participant who had a very hard time walking um, and would get very frustrated because she, the stairs at Broad and Erie are very steep. And she was like, I just went down these stairs. I don't think I can go back up again, um, which you know, is really frustrating to hear and to watch because if you're trying to get to work on time and you have to go up and down the stairs, that can be very exhausting and can deter you from using this. And you might just take an Uber or a different mode of transit because it's just too physically exhausting to use something that should be a public service. Um, the number one comment was there is no UR here on the maps. Um, so Lex, I'm glad to hear that <laughs> that's going to be a feature on the new maps. Um, and the maps also at Broad and Erie weren't very consistent. So we had this nice, lovely frequency map at the station, but it wasn't helpful for that particular station. It's great to you know, have the map before you leave your house, but it's not so great when you're in the station itself and you're trying to figure out which side of the platform you need to stand on. And there was also some damage to the maps, which made it really difficult to read. Uh, one of our participants like stared at the map for a while because a lot of these cigarette burns were blocking some of the information, and she couldn't figure out where she was supposed to be going because it was damaged. Um, another important part about the Broad Street line, uh, as Lex mentioned, is that sometimes you end up on the wrong one uh, unintentionally. And this is because you know Erie Station particularly uses a lot of language to refer to the spur and to the express that's inconsistent with the rest of the subtle language. Um, so for an example, the wording on this sign is very inconsistent. Uh, this suggests that the trains at this platform go to 8th and Market when they actually don't. Um, and you can see here more with the overlays of you know, the gaze plot on the eye tracking glasses that you get people staring at the southbound sign for a really long time trying to figure out what, what does this mean and why can't I figure it out just based on this sign because it's the only sign there. 
And so here, you know, some of the major takeaways from the Broad and Erie Station was, again, that visual clutter from, you know, all of the commercial signage that was blocking the very small septa signs, um, having to cross many busy streets, not knowing where you're going, especially with the small bus signs and having to make a bus transfer quickly. Um, you know, there is signage at this station, which, you know, was better than, you know, City Hall in terms of how much signage there was, but it was often incomplete or incorrect. Um, and then the inconsistent maps on the platforms, you know, that didn't match up with what information users actually needed to use at that exact moment. And so then we also uh, included in our research study a survey after the, um, the trial that they went through. And this was kind of an idea to really get some of those like personal responses from users. You know, how did they feel before and how did they feel after this um, exercise? And you know, most of the participants reported that finding the correct bus from both stations was the hardest thing, was making that rail to bus transfer, which isn't an uncommon thing for users to do. You often need to take the Broad Street line to a bus and then transfer again, and it should be easy to make those transfers. Um, and then deciding which of the BSL platforms to stand on to get to the correct you know, service pattern, whether you needed the express or whether you needed the spur or whether you needed you know, the local Broad Street line. Um, and you know, the blocked entryways and sign was a huge stress point as well. If you can't see a sign, if you can't go down the hallway that you think you need to go down, that's really frustrating and can often deter people from continuing to use the system because they don't, they don't trust the information that they've been given um, and you know, can't rely that the station is going to be open when they need it to be. And then these were some of the responses we had from users on how to make the wayfinding process more helpful, which um, as you saw in Lex's presentation, they really took these to heart. And a lot of these are now present in the recommendations that they've made. You know, clear signage um, and, you know, including the free high frequency bus network on the larger rail map to know where you can make transfers um, and having those transfer signs for buses actually in the stations, um, identifying staircases at the street level. Um, and, you know, updating the mobile app with subway stops, directions, and maps so that everything is consistent and that if you do have a smartphone on you, you can use it and you don't necessarily have to rely on the information that's there. But also having that information there as well if you don't have a smartphone or you don't want to use it. And this was such a uh, great quote that we had from a participant who was visiting Philadelphia, who was using the system for the first time, was that, you know, after all of the frustration and trying to figure out where to go, is that they liked riding the subway, you know? People loved SEPTA, and it was fast, it was clean, it was efficient, and, uh, you know, once you are actually able to know where you're going, uh, it's something that people enjoy using and that people feel comfortable with and want to be able to rely on. All right. Um, so now that you've seen a little bit uh, about our recommendations, about the process, about how we got there, um, you know, from big picture to very little picture, I think we're open to questions if anyone has got them. Was the New York City uh, subway system uh, wayfinding done by Danielle many years ago? Did you answer all? Uh, I mean, we've certainly looked at a ton of different systems um, globally for I inspiration. And obviously, a lot of different networks use letters and numbers and colors as a standard language. New York is certainly, as a city that is close and influential um, and culturally similar, was something that we've looked at. One way that we have incorporated some of the design language, um, you know, is in the pattern nomenclature. On, on the map, for example, using parallel lines in the same way that Vignelli did. Um, you know, but really, I think I think there there is not a single city that that we've borrowed a ton from. We've really tried to you know create something that is unique to um, Philadelphia. So um, certainly, it's been part of the of the process, but not heavily. I, I'd like to add to that that one of the, the first wayfinding studies that I did with my team was for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And what we were looking at was the connection between the JFK, the air train, and the subway. One of the things that really stuck out was 
there was a, a literal dividing line between the MTA and the Port Authority's land, and you could see the signs change in right in their terms, in their colors, in their symbols, and so on. And it, it really confused our our participants. And so when I see your your wayfinding plan, which is really focus on consistency across whatever kind of mode that you're on. That was a really big takeaway from, from us in New York was this, you know, was this line between the Port Authority and the MTA. But people just get off their plane and they, 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 don't, they don't care who's operating the system, right? They just want a seamless trip to take the train into, uh, in, you know, in, into, uh, into the center of the city. So, um, my question has like two parts. Uh, the first one is that what phase was the designer brought on board to the project? And how did the collaboration go between Concepta and the designer? Oh, okay. should I say it again? Oh, hello? Oh, great. <laughs> Great. So I have a two-part question. Um, the first part is uh, what phase of the project was the designer brought on board and how did that collaboration play out between SEPTA and the designer? So we have been working, um, you know, with the same designers and the same project team since the beginning of the project. So, you know, the same people who have designed the signs and the maps are the same people who moderated our workshops um, with stakeholders who did the site audits themselves in person. So, um, you know, it's it's been really cool in that way uh, to have a bunch of people get to know the system and stakeholders very intimately. Um, and incorporating that into the design. Uh, some of the people up front know my name, but they don't know that I'm here. My name is Jerry Silverman. I was the chair of the Citizen Advisory Committee in 1985, before most of you were alive. Um, and this is very refreshing. I, w I was at the uh, the Zoom last night and a couple other meetings, and it's 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 a dream come true because I've been complaining about the signage for 40 years, uh, including the fact that the subway surface signs are still visible after 15 years. They changed the terminology to trolley, but the SEPTA has refused to take those down. There are 40 signs that all say subway surface, but you don't call it that anymore. Um, but I, but I do want to point out four things specifically that you should take, uh, you should be aware of. The one that you showed, so many people were staring. All those green dots on the on the 15th Street station. That's because they put all those signs on the wrong side of the of the of the tracks. You just spent all that money to redo the 15th Street station, and every one of those signs is on the wrong side because those signs imply that you're supposed to take the exit and take the stairs to get to the other side. So uh, they they put them on the wrong side, uh, which is pitiful. Um, you have multiple station names, including three stations all named Allegheny. Uh, that, that should not be. That's very, very confusing. Two Spring Gardens, two Fairmounts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you have these new letters, like the B line. So one of the, one of the signs is R, an orange box with a white letter, and then you have a white letter in an orange box. So are you going to tell people, oh, you have to take the B1, but the one where the, letter, where the white letter is on the orange sign and not the orange letter on the white sign. That's very confusing. Same thing with the T3, where you have a green letter and it says Chester, and then you have a green, a white letter on a green box that says Chester Avenue. And the last one is, I would beg you, beg you, beg you to make 15th Street and City Hall and Suburban Station all called City Hall. It's all connected. It's they're, they are closer together than some of the other stations that you have that are called the same thing. So you might as well make it all one destination so everybody visiting Philadelphia knows that you can get to all those vehicles in within two blocks of each other and all have the same destination named City Hall. So that's my two cents for today. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. It's great to meet you in person for the first time. 
Um, and I swear I will respond to your email that you sent me on Sunday. It is in my to-do list. Um, but, you know, I think, I think that a lot of the concerns you brought up are really valid, um, you know, and they reflect some of the comments that we've gotten through this process, too. One is the duplicate station name problem. Like you said, we have two Spring Gardens. We have two Gerards. Um, you know, I don't, we don't have necessarily a recommendation for that yet. Um, this project is iterative in that right now what we are doing is trying to nail down the building blocks and then once those are nailed down we'll expand to a lot of the other details of wayfinding. But it is something that we plan to address, like we, we hear that all the time. Um, you know, I was happy to see you also on the Regional Rail Public Meeting last night. Um, the consolidation of City Hall and 15th Street, there was an article in the Inquirer like three years ago that was written by a guy who, who got lost because when you go in one direction, you transfer it at um, City Hall, and if you go in the other direction, you transfer at 15th Street. He was new to the city, and he missed the transfer point because he was just expecting the station to be named the same thing. Um, you know, because the first time he approached it on the Broad Street line, and the second time he approached it on the Market Frankfurt line. Um, you know, in our concepts, we've started to refer to that complex as 15th Street slash City Hall. I don't know if that is the term that we will go with. Um, you know, but we're trying to pilot the concept of talking about it like it is a single station. Um, you know, we haven't so far grouped suburban station into that. Um, you know, as you know, we do have the regional rail master plan going on, so that is something that, that, that we'll certainly try to look at. Um, you know, and then a lot of the things that you mentioned with, with signs that are out of date, with terminology that we haven't used for decades that you still can find in the system that's all really legitimate. Um, you know, and there are, um, you know, we're trying to fix that through design guidelines and creating a wayfinding system that is clearer, but ultimately there's work that we have to do on like the back of house side too, to make sure that organizationally we are ready to re respond, um, you know, to make sure that we get rid of outdated information, for example, or that all of our signs are c consistent. So, um, you know, I definitely hear all of your concerns and we've got our eyes on them. Can I add that when we were looking at the air train and, and, um, uh, and the subway to the air train, there were three stations named Jamaica uh, mm -hmm. on the way to ultimately the Jamaica station that gets you to the air train. And what we heard from our participants was that they felt like this was almost like an insider system that they weren't a part of <laughs> and, you know, made them feel really uncomfortable, right? Like it was a puzzle and they didn't know, they didn't know that answer and so I'm just just sharing that, that you know you, you brought up New York as well that this seems like a challenging this seems like a challenge that you know a number of agencies are, are facing all these sort of legacy naming uh, approaches that lead to a system that just if you if you know you know which is certainly not you know what we want in the system going forward yeah. one, one other point uh, for those of you who may not know this I don't think it's been mentioned yet is that SEPTA is the um, consolidation of several different transportation um, modes, right? So our subways weren't even built by the, the same system. And that's why we have a lot of um, difficult uh, ways to enter certain areas and get out of certain areas and the connections aren't as smooth as we would like. Definitely not as smooth as if one agency had designed the entire system. And so that also, just to let everybody know, that's also part of the challenge. Um, so thanks for, for pointing those out and thanks for volunteering for the, the CAC and the YAC. I was around in the 80s, so I definitely <laughs> appreciate it. I don't know how many people in this room were, but I definitely appreciate uh, those comments. Well, I have two logistical, logistical kind of questions. I realize there's two BQs and how do you tell them apart? And second of all, I know you mentioned uh, the um, Port 40 and MTA. So is SEPTA doing something special to unify the two? Um, yeah, so the question was about the difference between the two B2 designations that we have proposed and then also what we're doing with PACO. So 
Um, right now, B2 is the proposed um, nomenclature for the Broad Street Line Express, with the B1 being the Broad Street Line Local and the B3 being the Broad Street Spur. Um, the difference between the B with the solid box, or B2 with the solid box, and B2 with the hollow box, um, you know, is one, the solid box would mean in this way that it is a service that runs all the time, and a hollow box would mean that it is an infrequent special service. So the B2 with, with, a, um, with a hollow box is the Sports Express, um, which is just a Broad Street Line Express that continues to enter G one station. Um, so that is the proposed nomenclature right now. It's not necessarily what we'll go with, um, you know, because I think that people are also, we've received comments about how do you clearly designate an express, for example. Um, so we're going to continue to work on the clarity there. As far as PACO, like we've been speaking with them since the beginning of this project, and they're basically down with whatever we say. <laughs> it's just like, they're, they're like, we recognize this problem. We have the same problem. We will apply your recommendations, um, you know, so we've discussed also just like here and there in an informal way, like what letter, for example, would PADCO be in the same sort of setup, um, but I don't have any, I don't have any news there. It's all been very conversational so far. What was the age range of your participants or youth included? If not, uh, why not? Um, so all of the participants that we actually, Will, that is a question for you. Yeah. I don't remember. I know that we did have some participants from the Youth Advisory Council, but I don't actually know what their specific ages were. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Absolutely. So our youngest participant, I believe, was 18 years old. Um, but we found that they were close enough in proximity to a young person to hopefully be representative of those experiences. However, we do look at a wide variety of ways to incorporate those experiences. And we've also received a lot of comments from young people navigating SEPTA who are under the age of 18. So any ways that you have to suggest to incorporate um, the voices of high school, middle school, and elementary school students, um, we really would love to hear them. And I can't answer why we did not include anyone under 18. Um, one, this was an IRB approved project, um, and it would have been extremely time consuming and difficult to get it approved for anyone under the age of 18. And COVID, you know, we had to do this with masks on in the stations, and because no one under 18 could get vaccinated, uh, logistically it was going to be difficult. But um, obviously, as I mentioned in the presentation, you know, people traveling with children are a huge proportion of transit riders. Um, and I do have, you know, an anecdotal story. One of my coworkers is currently teaching her daughter to use SEPTA. Um, and she was very excited about this wayfinding project because it would mean that she felt safe allowing her fifth grader to use transit because she knew that her daughter could rely on these new signs to get her where she needs to go um, and not having to rely on this insider knowledge. You know, it's very simple. The signs would be pretty consistent. Um, and she was really happy to know that this system would be easy enough for anyone of any age to use uh, that didn't rely so much on reading and like knowing, you know, having muscle memory where you're going, but rather just following very simple signage and directions and colors, especially, um, that would be easy to use. So I'll just like sort of add really quickly that like we've had a phenomenal amount of youth engagement in this project, so they weren't involved in, in, in the eye tracking study. Um, you know, but some of the most enthusiastic supporters are, for example, like the Youth Advisory Council at SEPTA. Um, I was reading like a really, really intelligent, detailed comment the other day that was, must have been like honestly 2,000 words. Felt like it was written by like a transportation expert who's worked in the field for like 30 years and then it was signed, I want to join the YEC, but I'm only 14 years old. Is there anything you can do? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, do you know what I was doing when I was 14? Like, I was not writing comments like this. Um, so, so, you know, I think, I think um, we've tried to, to design a number of ways for, for, for different sorts of people to be involved in the, the project. We've gotten a pretty good range of ages.
uh, temporary information or information that changes all the time, like stairwell closures or even uh, elevators out of service, is one of the hardest things to deal with. Do you have any sort of philosophical approaches about how much do you depend on electronics? How much do you depend on, you know, chalkboards at the at the mm -hmm. ticket? station, just how do you approach that stuff that just changes so often and unpleasantly surprises people? Yeah, I think, I, you know, as, as noted um, during Camille's presentation for like the hallways that were closed, for example, we don't have a lot of great ways right now to present information for temporary service disruptions, whether that's a detour or something that's closed. Um, screens are obviously the ideal. Um, they're very expensive. Um, the screens that we have in the system right now are ad supported, but obviously that limits their efficacy for wayfinding as well because you only receive, you know, a certain percentage of, of the real estate on that screen. Um, we don't have any specific recommendations right now, and so I can't tell you exactly which strategy that you mentioned we'll go with, but we're looking at all of them. Um, chalkboards, um, whiteboards are, are, you know, things that we've seen even in systems like, like London that have world famous wayfinding systems, like sometimes they just have whiteboards, um, you know, actually in the cashier booth so, so you know, people can't erase them. Um, so we're certainly going to be looking at all of that and we recognize that that's a really, really important challenge. And I'd love to add that if one of our goals is to truly increase accessibility for particularly people who are mobility limited, it is absolutely critical that this information is at whatever decision point, the earliest possible decision point that somebody would choose a path that is ultimately a dead end. Uh, to go back to my airport example, uh, some of my participants were mobility limited and I had a, a gentleman who was in a wheelchair and we were about to go down a very, very long corridor, but he wasn't certain that this was the right corridor. And he turned to me and, and said, I'm really nervous right now because I'm going to go down this incredibly long corridor and there is a very, very good chance that I have to turn back and you know, just, just to share what he was feeling in, in the moment. And we had participants, we had mobility limited participants, we had um, able-bodied transit planners in, this, in the SEPTA simulation, uh, you know, go down hallways and then eventually have to come back because uh, even if there was signage, it was, it was too late. So I think that the, uh, the presence of signage and the placement of, si of signage in a way that, you know, discourages people at the earliest possible moment from making a wrong turn, you know, is, uh, is absolutely critical. What's the time frame to implement the project? So right now, um, we are focused on nailing down what we call the building blocks of wayfinding. So those are the colors and the letters and the shapes. They're the things that will make up every communications tool that, that we roll out as part of the project. Um, that's something that we're hoping to finalize in the coming months. Um, and then we will move forward with the design of a communications manual, of a wayfinding manual that we hope will be done um, about mid next year. The details of implementation will vary on a number of things, so I can't exactly tell you, you know, what that will look like. It could happen, for example, all at once. It could be phased line by line, um, you know, but those are discussions that, that we're currently having. I'm someone who's regularly traveled SEPTA um, since it was PTC. So I'm one of those crusty old Philadelphians who doesn't like anything to change, and I think this is fantastic. Um, I think it's wonderful that you're acknowledging. There's um, one of my more recent hats is also a real as a realtor, and it's interesting that people see things with tracks as something they can rely on, both long term, like oh, if I live here. I will continue to be able to get here. They're not going to move my bus, even though most bus routes in Philadelphia have been there for 80 years. <laughs> so that's another topic. Another that's another night. topic. Um, and I think, you know, so I'm curious, um, a broad question, I have a specific question. A broad question is, um, also someone who's traveled trans in a lot of other cities around the world is, um, you know, it seems like 
again, tra tracks versus buses is something that people not familiar with the city, tourists, business travelers. Um, so I'm curious how you're looking at that versus, say, other parts of the system to realize that broader range of, hopefully encouraging broader range of use. And, and the thing that has been driving me crazy since I first saw this is, and Leslie, with all due deference to your former role in Montgomery County, mm -hmm. I know Norristown's the county seat. Um, as someone who talks to, you know, lives out on the train line, the Pelly line, um, we kind of know the Montgomery County suburbs are on the train and the Delaware County suburbs are on the Norristown High Speed Line. You know, almost every stop along the Norristown High Speed Line is a Delaware County suburb, not a Montgomery County suburb. So I find that confusing to call it a Montgomery County line. Yeah, so, you know, on the Norristown High Speed Line, I think, I think about half the stations are in Montgomery County and half are in Delaware, more or less. The reason why we were comfortable using that term is because the line terminates in the county seat of Montgomery County, whereas the Media Sharon Hill lines, they terminate in the, or one terminates in, in the county seat of Delaware County. Um, you know, in the future with KOP Rail, um, the Norris County Speed Line will also serve the largest employment center in M Montgomery County. Now, like that being said, any term that you use for the line is not going to be e exact. Um, at, well, at some point, you just have to pick a letter and stick with the letter and use it consistently. Um, you know, and what we heard from our outreach is that people would rather us pick letters that correlate to something than do it randomly, like A, B, C, D, E, or one, two, three, four, five. Um, you know, so so that that is what we were trying to, to, to do there. I would expect that over over time, the term Montgomery um, would drop out, and it would just become the M line. Um, you know, but it's it's kind of dependent on how exactly that that goes when it is received by the, the public. But you know, I do understand. I grew up in that in that same area. Um, you know, and I started thinking about this th th this problem growing up near the Norris County Speed Line and not understanding where it went um, as a kid. <laughs> and I love trains. I didn't know where it went. It's so crazy, but it's shouldn't be. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, I, f I forgot what the first part of your the question was. About, um, the fact that things on rails are more like yeah. used by people not familiar with the city. So yeah, Insiders use the buses. That's, that is a really important point, and um, I hope to make it explicitly that the reason why buses are not included in this is because we're currently undergoing a process to redesign our bus network through bus revolution. It's really hard to make any assumptions about what sort of wayfinding will work for a bus network that does not exist yet. That being said, um, you know, trying to encourage connections between the rail transit metro network and the bus system is going to be an extreme priority. We lack that signage almost everywhere. And ultimately, when it comes to addressing the sorts of travel trends that I mentioned in our presentation, um, you know, like trying to have a system that is convenient around the clock and isn't just nine to five and is affordable, um, it is the frequent buses, for example, that really achieve that in a large part of the city and the region. Um, so we're going to be looking at, as a, as a subsequent step, how to marry the bus network with the system that we are currently developing. Um, but I, you know, we're going to have to wait a little bit to actually figure out what that bus network is going to be. The Frankfurt Transportation Center, because that seems to be like that 69th Street massive places where those transfers happen. Yeah, oh yeah, FTC, um, I think, uh, you know, like D Direct Bus, for example, serves FTC, uh, that which is like a BRT light sort of service. Um, I think we're going to be looking into ways to expand that, for example, um, to create like a spectrum of services, so it's not just... So I've been doing similar studies. Since oh, are, 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 are we going to study at FTC? We don't have that, with the eyeglasses, we don't have that on the agenda, but FTC will Will certainly be like a, a, a focal point of future wayfinding research. I, I'd like to mention that 
you know, the, the buses might not be accessible or conceptually accessible to visitors. It, in, in our shadowing and data collection, they're not accessible to people who, who, who live here and want to ride them. And, I, you know, when Camille presented that, that, that observation that, you know, buses aren't on, on the map and buses aren't integrated. And when we asked people to transfer to the bus from the rail, they didn't, they didn't know where to go. I am so excited to see what rail to bus transfer transfers look like, what bus ridership looks like, just when, you know, buses are more authentically integrated into the rail network, right? And, you know, I think that just kicks off a, a positive spiral of, you know, more of a culture of, you know, the buses are a part of this system that I would certainly hope would sort of permeate the, you know, the, 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 the mindset of visitors and, uh, and locals alike. Yeah, our, our, our first, um, you know, sort of wayfinding project a few years ago was to create the first map of our frequent bus network or our bus network in tiers of frequency, which has been, um, you know, a trend for transit agencies over the past 10 years. And that really speaks to, like, what you're saying that in people's minds, the bus network doesn't exist because you can't see it. So, like, if you actually start putting the, the buses on maps, they start to, like, live in a way that they didn't to some people previously, like to actually be able to visualize, for example, the 47 that's got a higher ridership than the Paley Thorndale line, um, you know, is really important when, when trying to communicate all of the sorts of transit options you have at your disposal. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is there, will there be like any kind of testing for the signage and um, other implements of the wayfinding system, for example, the poles and stuff like that, will that be uh, tested in any way um, or compared somehow? And um, what was the decision to go with Roboto as the, the typeface versus um, other ones like um, Mozilla Fira or um, Adobe's OpenSans? Um, I'd like a little more insight on, on those. So, um, you know, like I mentioned right now, we're trying to nail down the building blocks and there's lots of sorts of different signs that we haven't started to design yet. We are absolutely going to be testing them um, in, in various ways. And that's part of this project that I think is most exciting is that there are going to be a lot of opportunities to engage with different groups of people in the future as these products are developed. Um, for example, like a neighborhood map, if you create a neighborhood map of a station area, like there's really great opportunities there to work with the community and figure out what they want on that map. Um, you know, so I, I think that we're going to be constantly getting feedback, redesigning, getting feedback, redesigning. Um, so please visit the website um, and, you know, and keep up to date on the project because I, I anticipate those opportunities to continue. Um, Roboto was chosen uh, because it is so strong on um, both in print and on the web. Um, and, and there's a hope, you know, as we are moving, as we are moving into the future, that more of our signage will be digital. Um, so having a font that is strong on a digital screen is important. Um, if you, um, like you mentioned some fonts that like full disclosure, I don't know very well. I'm not a font expert. Um, but if you have recommendations, I would love to hear them because we're certainly not set on that. Um, so it's great to see, you know, SEPTA embracing this uh, cutting edge research and technology and, uh, of course, building on this great relationship with our department. Um, I'm interested in um, if you thought about any other applications of the eye tracking technology for projects at SEPTA or things you've seen elsewhere with this technology. Um, well, I think one answer to your question, I think, goes along with the, the last question, is that I think a really special feature of what we can do with the, with the glasses is uh, look at before and after, right? So we can actually start to think about signage, um, uh, bike lanes, any kind of change, you know, perturbation to the transportation system, we could really start to think about it as an intervention, almost like from an epidemiological approach, and think about the before and the and the after, right? So, you have ten people do a mission 
uh, you know, um, transfer from you know the the Broad Street line to the Market Frankfurt line, um, and then you have ten more people do the same mission, but you take down a sign, or you put up a sign, or you put up three signs, or so on, right? And you and you using data science look at the difference in their stress levels, their you know their their cognitive workload, and so on throughout the the mission, and you can really gain gain some insight as to what was the impact of you know putting in these signs or, or taking down these signs. And this is something that we're already doing with uh, the Spruce Pine bike lanes, for example, right? The, we collected data before the city put in the, the protected bike lanes, we collected data after, and now we're looking at the difference in the trends of cognitive workload for our participants who went before and after. So I think that's a, I think that's a great I think that's a great application. Um, they're also very widely used in uh, signage design and, and website design. Uh, so one of the things, I've mentioned the Port Authority a few times, uh, one of the things we were able to tell the Port Authority is uh, we were able to help them design their signs and also design the air train uh, changeable message signs. Uh, because we could really watch people's eyes go through the signs. Some of the signs were so wordy. Please go this way if you have this much luggage, but then go this way if you have this much luggage. It was so many words. People were just staring at it and right, going back and forth. Wait, should I go here? And so we were able to, to, show, to show them, you know, with empirical data, you know, this sign has way too many words. If you design it like this, this is how people would take in this information. And, and, and that, was, um, that, that was really powerful. Powerful. We're going to call it a night. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all for your excellent questions. Um, just really, really enjoyed, really enjoyed uh, uh, hearing from everyone. Really enjoyed this incredibly engaging uh, conversation. Really enjoyed this celebration of our school and, uh, and, and department played out through SEPTA wayfinding. So thanks so much for joining us.